Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started if the participants could turn on their cameras. Okay, well, uh, welcome everybody. Um, I'm John Rodriguez, Stonehill College, um, and it's uh, my um, distinction to uh, host this uh, session. I think we have the distinction, I guess, of being the first uh, panel of the 2023 uh, LHA meeting. I believe that's the case. Um, and the title of this um, panel is Diplomacy, Politics, and the Press uh, in Louisiana. Um, I will uh, go ahead and introduce um, our first speaker, uh, who is uh, Jeffrey Owens. Uh, Dr. Owens uh, received his PhD uh, at Louisiana State University in 1999, and I remember it well, uh, with a dissertation on the origins of the levees um, of the Mississippi uh, River prior to 1845. Uh, he received an MA in history from the University of Texas at Tyler and a BFA from the University of North Texas. Uh, Dr. Owens has worked for 22 years as a full-time professor at Tyler Junior College. Uh, for seven years, he was the department chair of history, geography, and anthropology. His articles have appeared in Agricultural History, Louisiana History, Georgia Historical Quarterly, and East Texas Historical Journal. And he's reviewed books for Southwestern Historical Quarterly, Southern Studies, East Texas Historical Journal, Journal of South Texas, and the Gulf South Historical Review. Uh, Dr. Owens was the 2014 and 2020 president of the Gulf South Association, very commendable, he did it twice, and serves on the board of the North Louisiana Historical Association. And his paper is entitled, uh, Yucatan's Failed Bid to be Annexed to the United States. Jeffrey? Thank you. Yucatan did not become the 30th state in 1848. Wisconsin did. If few people today realize that the peninsular tip of Southeast Mexico offered to be annexed at the close of the Mexican War, the reasons the U.S. refused at least make sense in the context of the time. Yucatan was densely populated by Spanish-speaking Catholics and indigenous Maya, neither of whom seemed compatible with the population of the USA. It was remote from the continental United States and had no notable natural resources. Acquiring it would not produce a new slave state, nor would it advance the electability of either Democrats or Whigs. The acquisition made sense geopolitically to expansionists with a global perspective, but manifest destiny and empire building did not appeal to the same fan base. A proposal from President Polk to intervene in a race war there on humanitarian grounds sparked thoughtful debate in the U.S. Senate pitting Washington's farewell address against varied interpretations of the Monroe Doctrine. Although Louisiana was not central to the controversy, it sat directly across the Caribbean and had a similar economy based on international trade and cash crops. Louisiana newspapers showed a keen interest in Yucatan in 1848 and kept their readers informed. Louisiana Whig Senator Henry Johnson's actions are also illuminating. This paper will present basic facts about the context of Yucatan's offer to be annexed, explain how President Polk got involved, and summarize positions taken by those who could have made it happen. Yucatan, even today, sees itself as distinct from Mexico. Its people were Maya, not Aztec. Its conquest was initiated by Montejo, not Cortez. The natives' defeat in 1547 brought a regional administration, a captaincy general in the Viceroyalty of New Spain, and in 1786, a separate entendency. During the Mexican Revolution, Yucatan declared independence from Spain separately from Mexico and only joined the Mexican Empire two months later. The fall of Emperor Turbide in March of 1823 caused Mexican provinces to define themselves as independent states. Yucatan joined the United Mexican States as a federated republic in December of that year. Yucatan's acceptance of national rule by Mexico was predicated on state sovereignty. Mexico's Federalist Constitution of 1824 allowed self-government, and Yucatan's Constitution of 1825 contained numerous reforms later toppled by Santa Ana. 
When Texas, Coahuila, and Zacatecas revolted or declared independence in 1835 and 1836, only Texas successfully broke away. In 1839, a Federalist leader in Yucatan supplied weapons to the Maya, offering land if they would help repulse Santa Ana. Leaders in two cities competed for control of the Yucatan independence movement. From 1840 to 1848, Miguel Barachano of Merida held Yucatan's governorship five times, and Santiago Mendez of Campeche four times. Merida was an inland city flourishing from the cultivation of henequen fiber on estates owned by Criollo Spaniards. The port of Campeche, on the other hand, relied on seaborne trade for its prosperity. Merida and its plantation elite were vulnerable to attack by the native Maya, while Campeche was more exposed to naval invasion and blockades. One point that arose during the U.S. Senate debate of 1848 was, is Yucatan independent? Could it be annexed even if we want it? There were people in Yucatan who claimed it was independent. A national flag was raised in 1841 when Yucatan and Tabasco to the west were discussing a merger as one country. Yucatan's Chamber of Deputies voted for independence from Mexico in October of 1841. The Republic of Yucatan included Campeche and Quintana Roo, now separate states, but Tabasco elected to rejoin Mexico in 1842 when Santa Ana invaded Yucatan and put it under blockade. Whether the Republic of Yucatan was sovereign or federal depended on who was winning. Santa Ana's land invasion stalled short of taking Campeche or Merida, and the Republic of Texas Navy aided Yucatan by sea. That gave Yucatan the chance to pose as a country, but it does not seem that any sovereign nation other than perhaps Texas recognized Yucatan's independence. Whatever independence it had was declared by the Criollos, partly sustained by weapons given to the Maya. Federalists in Yucatan dreamed of freedoms achieved in the Republic of Texas. The Yucatan Constitution of 1841 included freedom of religion, trial by jury, no forced civil or military service, and writs of amparo to defend individual rights. As in the rest of Mexico, there was no slavery in Yucatan. However, the Maya suffered from debt slavery, heavy taxes, and the taking of communal land for henequen farming. The annexation of Texas and the Mexican War led to complications for Yucatan. Senor Mendez and Campeche expected the USA to fight Mexico and press for independence to avoid a U.S. naval blockade. Barbachano and Merida feared rural unrest and remained open to rejoining Mexico. By 1846, there were essentially two governments. Barbachano of Merida and the Congress of Yucatan voted to rejoin Mexico and submit to Santa Ana, but Mendez and the Campeche faction rejected it. They announced Yucatan was neutral and asked the USA to suspend its blockade, meanwhile arming the Maya to push Barbachano from office. When Barbachano resigned, the Mendez faction placed Domingo Barrett in office and considered independence to be a fact. The USA, on the other hand, accepted that Yucatan had approved reunion with Mexico, brushed aside its claim to neutrality, and restricted Yucatan's trade with blockades and tariffs. The economy spiraled downward. Most importantly, racial and class tensions exploded when armed Mayans mutinied against their Criollo officers at Valladolid in 1847, causing an eight-day spree of massacre and plunder. The caste war that this kicked off didn't ultimately end until 1901. Five days before the mutiny, a Criollo judge left for Washington, D.C. to ask that neutrality be respected. The judge knew nothing about the race war when he received his instructions, but heard of it when he arrived in the U.S. Informally, he asked Polk's Secretary of State, James Buchanan, whether the USA might want to just uh, annex Yucatan. Buchanan stated he didn't think a single vote could be found in Congress. A capable Maya leader, Jacinto Pot, began to organize an offensive war on the Criollos. Sackings, massacres, and retaliations proceeded on both sides, and refugees fled for the coast. Seeking weapons and the resumption of trade, Provisional President Barrett deputized the son-in-law of Mendez to seek relief from the USA. 
On arriving in America, Buchanan asked what Yucatan wanted. The deputy, Eusto Sierra O'Reilly, said that the USA lift its blockade and ruinous tariffs. It took Buchanan longer to reply than Sierra liked, and instead of calling him a handsome old man full of affability and courtesy, Sierra's diary began to refer to this hypocrite, Mr. Buchanan. On Christmas Eve, 1847, Buchanan responded that President Polk could not lift the blockade due to wartime necessities and because Yucatan's own government had proclaimed its reunion in, with Mexico, but he would revise the tariff on domestic products. This lifting of sanctions was a partial victory. Unfortunately, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo took precedence over concerns about Yucatan. The Senate had ratified the, U the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and sent it to Mexico for approval. And when Sierra reached Buchanan, he found, quote, the silly old man completely preoccupied with the upcoming Democratic Party convention. He hopes he will be nominated for president. I believe he pays no attention to what I say, but he grips my hands with much cordiality. Sierra told Buchanan that if the USA wouldn't help, Yucatan would be forced to appeal to Britain or Spain, which would violate the Monroe Doctrine. Buchanan responded by going on vacation. So Sierra wrote Polk directly for an interview. Surprisingly, the president agreed. He found Polk attentive and sympathetic. Buchanan himself arrived near the end of the conversation. The president assured Sierra he would consider what could be done to relieve Yucatan and would decide within a few days. What Sierra did not admit was that on the day of this interview, he also received a note from Mendez offering dominion and sovereignty over the country to whichever country would save them from the Maya, whether the USA, Britain, or Spain. Mendez ordered Sierra to present the offer to be annexed to President Polk, and he also made the same offer to Britain and Spain. Sierra wrote in his diary, my God, how unwise is this measure? But using the standard diplomatic channels, he sent the annexation offer to Buchanan, who took it to the cabinet meeting. Immediately, Polk wrote Congress to consider intervention on humanitarian grounds to save the whites from the Indians and to prevent Britain or Spain from using the crisis to possess or colonize the country. Once it hit the Senate, it became a political football. Sierra commented, Yucatan is now a party question. God knows the fate that will befall it. I have a few samples of uh, editorials from the New Orleans and Baton Rouge papers about this issue. Who will have Yucatan? The great Yucatanese nation is ready to deliver herself up body and soul to whatever power will take upon itself the onerous task of delivering her from the Barbaros. 2,000 American riflemen could drive these unarmed, undisciplined savages into the Pacific, but the descendants of the magnanimous Spaniards are reduced to the pitiable necessity of soliciting foreign aid. Some adventurous Yankees should seize on this speculation. We suspect, however, that the Yucatanos would not stick to their bargain once the Indians are subdued. I'll skip over some of these and go to something I felt was more interesting, the debate in the U.S. Senate. Once a bill stood before the Senate, positions had to be taken. Surprisingly, few Democrats spoke in favor of Polk's proposition, while, unsurprisingly, the Whigs uniformly criticized it. No published comments from Democratic Senator Solomon Downs of Wachita Parish were found, he chaired the committees on engrossed bills and private land claims, neither of which required leadership in territorial expansion or foreign aid. With no prospect of converting Yucatan into a slave state, was there any compelling reason for Southern Democrats to support intervention? Whig Senator Henry Johnson of Point Capee Parish did appear in the news from Washington, but his focus was purely economic. One of Johnson's rebel Resolutions called on the Treasury Secretary to report on the quality of sugar imported into the U.S. over time, another in favor of federal aid for lighthouses. His only role in the Yucatan debate was to repeatedly move to postpone the vote. In spite of Louisiana's disengagement, every speech published yields insights into how Americans thought. 
Senator John C. Calhoun poured scorn on Polk's proposal to intervene as a perversion of the Monroe Doctrine. I did hope that the Mexican War, that precipitate and rash enterprise, would have taught the administration some moderation. Are we to usurp the dominion of every portion of this continent? Polk's construction of the Monroe Doctrine commits the USA to interpose and protect any people in the Americas. These are startling propositions. To what extent may it not be pursued? Besides, according to Calhoun, the whites of Yucatan were themselves to blame for their dilemma, quote, acting upon the idea that all men are entitled to the enjoyment of liberty and that one man is as good as another. They liberated all those who we chose to call slaves. These slaves have wheeled around and become their murderers. Such must be the end and result of all the false philanthropy of the age. Senator David Hannigan of Indiana hoped there would be no opposition to this bill, but felt he must reply. The English are hastening with racehorse speed to seize upon the entire isthmus, have already seized Belize and the whole Mosquito Coast to obtain the route to link the Atlantic and the Pacific. Yucatan shakes hands with Cuba. Look at the map. If England gets Yucatan now, in five years she will control the whole Gulf of Mexico. If Cuba is the key, Yucatan is the lock. Place them in the hands of England, and she controls the mouth of the Mississippi as surely as the Thames. Senator Clayton, Del Clayton of Delaware warned it was bad faith to approve intervention in Mexico just after sending a peace treaty. Will they not conclude we are using humanitarian aid as an excuse to take even more of their territory? How can we annex a country whose independence we've never even recognized? As for humanitarian concerns, what about the health and lives of our own soldiers? Senator Jefferson Davis of Mississippi commented, the Monroe Doctrine is not the issue. We are at war with Mexico and Yucatan is a part of it. Yucatan and the island of Cuba must be ours. Senator John J. Crittenden's response, we make war on what we call the savages to prevent them from murdering the whites. England, France, Spain make war on us because we have interfered. Thus, war is got up on all sides in the name of humanity. Besides, these people are citizens. There is no such thing as slavery there. How is what they are doing different from Guatemala? We consider Guatemala a government and send a diplomatic agent. What the Indians in Yucatan are doing is the same thing done by the Guatemalans 20 years ago. No doubt this is a cruel war, but the Indians have for 300 years been victims of misgovernment and cruelty. As for banishing an army of our own citizens there, that is another question. We cannot protect the whites for a day and have them slaughtered on the morrow. It must be an occupation. How many men? How much money? How long have you bound us to this service? At present, I can answer none of these questions. Therefore, I must vote against this bill. The debate reached its climax on a day when a vote was expected. While Senator Dix was talking, a telegram revealed that whites and Indians had concluded a treaty of peace. There were now no grounds for humanitarian intervention. With this, Senator Hannigan moved that the measure be tabled. Senator Underwood ignored it and accused Polk of caring nothing about Yucatan until he had been offered the sovereignty of the country. Senator Niles called Senator Hannigan a warmonger. Senator Foote embarked on an hour-long rebuke to Senator Calhoun. Finally, Senator Houston of Texas got the floor. He said that although the discussion had not been strictly regular, we have heard from the advocates of war and peace, quote, I therefore move the Senate go into secret session. The countenance of those around him looked gloomy from the presentiment of a cold dinner. Oh no, they cried, adjourn, adjourn. And so Yucatan was lost. The bill never came to a vote. That treaty was broken as soon as it was written. Without help from the USA, the Mendez faction fell from power. And in August 1848, Barbashano of Merida decreed Yucatan's reunion with Mexico, whose army subdued the Maya for the Criollos. Wisconsin became a state instead, and the House began debating the Wilmot Proviso, leading to a civil war of our own. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, very interesting. Um, okay, our next presenter is uh, Sophia Roos. 
Um, she is uh, currently working on her MA in history at Texas A&M uh, University. She received her BA um, in history and in world languages and literatures, focusing on German from the University of Memphis, uh, where she completed um, an undergraduate thesis, an honors thesis, which received uh, a number of awards, uh, entitled Germanic Emigration to Memphis, um, 1865 um, to 1880, where she did that under the advisorship of my uh, dear friend and former colleague, uh, Susan uh, O'Donovan. Um, Ms. Uh, Roos has already, uh, though she's early in her career, has already received a number of awards, um, scholarships, and fellowships. Uh, this academic year, in fact, she is her education is being supported by a Phi Alpha Phi Fellowship. Uh, she was a Fulbright uh, finalist uh, among uh, these awards. Uh, her um, undergraduate uh, thesis was published in the, and I'm not going to try to pronounce the title of this journal, but the, the University of Memphis uh, Undergraduate Research uh, Journal. Um, she has also um, completed a number of internships or insist assistantships, including uh, one at the Shiloh National Military Park. Uh, she's also presented uh, a number of times, conferences and other presentations at the University of Memphis, uh, but also at Phi Alpha Theta Regional Conference, uh, where she received uh, an award for the best paper in the panel. And she's also presented at the National Conference of Undergraduate uh, Research. Uh, her, uh, the title of her uh, work today, her presentation, which I assume is uh, derived from her MA work, uh, is uh, post-Civil War politics and the democratic German language press of New Orleans. Uh, Ms. Roos. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so this is a part of my MA thesis or a part that I'm hoping to expand on in my MA thesis. But anyways, um, the United States experienced an influx of immigration during the mid 19th century from Central Europe, primarily the German states. Once in the US, most Germans established communities in the Midwest and Northeast, Pockets of Germans, however, settled throughout the southeastern United States near port cities such as New Orleans. As in other German communities, German New Orleans integrated into the United States and underwent their own ethnogenesis in the late 19th century. The Tagliche Deutsche Zeitung, arguably the most significant German language newspaper published in New Orleans during this period, offers insight into the German New Orleans political ethnogenesis after the Civil War. Additionally, Two English language papers, the Times Picayune and the New Orleans Republican, help represent the German New Orleans political ethnogenesis during this era. This paper argues that German immigrants, specifically the Tagliche Deutsche Zeitung's editor, George Forster, altered their publications to accommodate the larger Anglo New Orleans population, which contributed to the paper's longevity. Although the paper reports neutrally during Reconstruction, once Reconstruction ended, the paper's democratic stances reappeared. And before I continue, um, just a note on terminology, I have used the word ethnogenesis. Um, and ethnogenesis simply refers to the historical process of German New Orleans identity formation, although it is used more typically by anthropologists and sociologists. And I use it just because um, the term itself relies on the formation and the process rather than the final result. And so um, German New Orleans ethnogenesis occurred during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, primarily due to German involvement in politics and the societal changes in the South following the Civil War. Their connection to their homeland during the unification of Germany is also a significant influence. The Tagliche Deutsche Zeitung shows one aspect of the changing ethnogenesis. The paper underwent at least seven name changes between 1848 through 1907, as different editors and publishers worked at the press. These differences, however, illuminate how German New Orleans engaged with American and German political affairs simultaneously. As I see it, this paper is a part of a larger project that seeks to understand the German New Orleans community and their engagement in both American and German political affairs, German Americans are arguably one of the most unique immigrant groups due to their cultural preservation and self-awareness in their host communities. The German New Orleans identity, as represented through the Tagliche Deutsche Zeitung in this case, shows their ability to understand their place in a pluralist society. A pluralist society involves different cultural, political, and social groups that coexist, so essentially New Orleans. 
An examination of the Taglische Deutsche Zeitung during the mid to late 19th century offers more insight about Germans in plural New Orleans. While German immigrants scattered throughout the United States, their immigration to the Midwest, Northeast, and Texas has been the focus of most scholarship. German settlements, however, extended beyond these regions, obviously. Census records therefore reveal how German New Orleans challenged this traditional German immigration narrative. Rather than moving beyond the port city, some Germans remained in New Orleans or traveled south from northern ports. While their experiences in some regard mirror their northern counterparts, the southern German American ethnogenesis is arguably different due to these regional variations. The case of New Orleans reveals patterns that differentiates it from the extant scholarly literature on German assimilation into American culture. New Orleans is, in some sense, a forgotten and therefore understudied city within the history of the German-speaking United States. Yet, it hosted a large number of Germans, both as they passed through the city and as they settled into the city. German New Orleans should serve as a distinct study in regards to their contributions to the city due to their sizable population. In the 1850s, the German population reached 11,425 and grew as more Germans immigrated into the Crescent City. The German population peaked in 1816 at 15,934, but it fell to 10,479 by 1870. Nonetheless, the group remained one of the largest immigrant populations in the city. Following the Civil War, legislation focused on redefining citizenship discussed at both the national and state levels solicited reactions from the German New Orleans community. Drawing upon scholarship about Midwestern Germans, and the United States during the Reconstruction Era and Gilded Age, as well as period newspapers, this paper seeks to understand how German New Orleans responded to the changing political world around them. New Orleans' large German population is best represented by the variety of German language newspapers that thrived in the city from 1848 until 1907. Through either a religious or political stance, these papers reflect the larger German New Orleans community. Among these, the democratic Taglische Deutsche Zeitung is arguably the most influential and successful German language paper in New Orleans. At its peak in 1875, the paper circulated 5,088 copies within the state and with some copies going as far as Texas. The paper's longevity can be attributed to the technical changes over the 60 year period and the editor's and publisher's political experiences during the late 19th century. The differences between the publishers and the editors provide insight about the paper's politics. Political Germans, known as 48ers, primarily worked in the German language press throughout the United States. In the wake of the failed 1848 revolutions in the German states, political refugees immigrated to the US. As they integrated into their new homeland, they engaged with American politics with similar, with similar enthusiasm as in the German states. In the case of the Taglische Deutsche Zeitung, the publishers actually differed from the editor during the Reconstruction era. While active in politics, the publishers did not immigrate from Germany as 48ers. German immigrant, these German immigrants' interest in the printing press began once they were in the United States. The editor during the Reconstruction era, however, was a traditional 48er who immigrated to the United States with press experience from Germany. During a majority of the Taglische Deutsche Zeitung's publication, the publishers pub function as an Aktion Gesellschaft, or a shared corporation in English. Owned by Jacob Hossinger, Albert Heim, Valentin Mears, and Charles F. Buck. Of these four men, Jacob Hossinger and Charles F. Buck were the most prominent as leaders in the German New Orleans community. The two other men invested in the Taglische Deutsche Zeitung's publishing cooperation, Albert Heim and Valentin Mears, were not as prominent in either the German community or the Crescent City. No consistent information about Valentin Mayers is available. However, Albert Heim, Albert Heim was active in the city. He served as a sergeant in the military and worked as a horse breeder. His advertisements appeared throughout the English language papers. And like Hossinger and Buck, Heim was not a traditional 48er as well. Jacob Hossinger, however, was the most notable member of the Taglische Deutsche Zeitung shared cooperation. He was born in Bavaria and immigrated to the United States as a child in 1841. As the founder of the Germania Savings Bank, a businessman and a city politician, Hossinger was known throughout the city. The press propel propelled Hossinger as a leader among German New Orleans, New Orleans. He started as a teenage apprentice at the Deutsche Zeitung. 
once, he, once in the United States. After the apprenticeship ended, Hossinger worked full-time at the press until he purchased the press himself by, in 1858. Hossinger considered the preservation of the German culture and promotion of German character to be the paper's purpose. Notably, however, Hossinger also served on the board of the Ramey Planting Manufacturing and Paper Making Company of Louisiana, which was responsible for all paper production in the state at its charter in 1871. Considered one of the spokesmen of the German New Orleans community, Hossinger was well received within the German community and larger Crescent City. Like Hossinger, Charles F. Buck work in the Charles F. Buck's work in city politics distinguished him as a notable German aside from the German New Orleans community. Born in Baden, Germany, Buck immigrated to the United States in 1852. As a lawyer, theater participant, and member of the New Orleans Board of Education, Buck gained prominence both within the German community and the Crescent City. Politically, Buck differed from Hossinger, however. Buck was elected as a Democrat to the Louisiana House of Representatives between 1895 through 1897 and ran for mayor twice in New Orleans, but lost. Although Hossinger engaged with American politics, he never formally ran for any government position like Buck. The editor during the Reconstruction era, George Forster, immigrated to St. Louis from Germany in wake of the failed 1848 revolutions. Once in the United States, Forster engaged with American politics through the German language press, like other 48ers. In 1860, Forster accepted a job at the Taglische Deutsche Zeitung. Although hired by another, by another German language press in New Orleans before the Civil War, Forster sent pro-unionist letters to a friend in New Orleans while working as a correspondent for a press in New York. His pro-union pro-unionist sentiments, which were published by a rival German language paper in New Orleans, traveled throughout the city. Forster, therefore, was forced to flee New Orleans as soon as he arrived in 1860 as pro-Confederate New Orleans worked against him. Finally, Forster officially began editing the Taglische Deutsche Zeitung starting in 1869. This turmoil influenced how opinionated Forster appeared in the press during the Reconstruction era. To understand the German response to re Reconstruction legislation, a brief overview of Louisiana between 1868 and 1870 is required. In 1868, Louisiana rejoined the Union. However, readmission created rifts in the city as the Republican Party dominated the state government. The new Republican state legislator, had, led by Republican Governor Henry Clay Warma, faced backlash from state Democrats as it sought to give the state more power than the cities. Prior to 1868, New Orleans controlled the Board of Education, the Police Board, and the City Council. Throughout the year, state legislation shifted the control from New Orleans to the state government, angering Democratic New Orleans in the process. The state's interference in the New Orleans City, city Council, however, arguably sparked the most controversy throughout the city. According to legislation passed in 1868, the governor was allowed to fill vacant offices and city councils where the previous incumbent did not fulfill his entire term. However, problems arose between Democrats and Republicans in New Orleans as New Orleans judges scrambled to hand down a cohesive decision about whether they would enforce Warmoth's appointments. The 1869 city alderman election results in Warmoth's appointment saw Hossinger appointed. The German community's involvement with state government during the Reconstruction era, specifically this period, is best represented through their desire to integrate into their new homeland while also remaining cognizant of their German identity. In the early Reconstruction era, Germans maintained a neutral stance on political issues as their new homeland changed. Federal and state Reconstruction era legislation altered the city of New Orleans. Notably, 1865 and 1870 saw two significant changes in the United States definition of citizenship through the ratification of the 14th and 15th Amendments. In response to these changes, Hossinger, Forster, and Buck banded with other Germans to form the German Political Reform Club in 1870. As German New Orleans witnessed the United States change, they sought to act as United States citizens while also remaining in tune with their German identity. While the Taglische Deutsche Zeitung remained politically neutral during the American Reconstruction era, the corruption of the Louisiana state government pushed Germans to form the German Political Reform Club. In the English, in the English language Democratic Times-Picayune and New Orleans Republican, the German Political Reform Club, 
published accounts of their meetings. Hence, Reconstruction Louisianan legislation appeared as only one factor in the German political ethnogenesis. The German Political Reform Club first appears in the Times Picayune and the New Orleans Republican on February 13, 1870, the official date Congress ratified the 15th Amendment. The papers go on to state the intention of the club was to investigate corruption in state elections and affairs for, our, for all New Orleans, not just the German community. An initial report from the Times from the Times Picayune shows Germans acting not as a voting bloc for either the Democratic or Republican Party, but rather they formed their own coalition intended to act with and as American citizens. As at, the, at one of the first meetings for the German Political Reform Club, President Charles Puthoff stated that part of the club's mission was, though Germans by birth they were, by naturalization citizens of this country were all their interests concentrated and they must endeavor to act in concert with those of the native born citizens who are alike opposed to the corruption. The message further goes on to, and stresses that German New Orleans must not follow politicians based solely on party affiliation. Despite stating that the coalition acted in favor of all New Orleans, the meetings, however, were conducted in German with English and French statements issued only after the meetings in the papers the next day. The German Political Reform Club's interactions with the English language Times Picayune are a key component to the formation of their ethnogenesis and represents how the larger city viewed the German language political club. Although the group claimed to represent all New Orleans, the German Political Reform Club was accused of creating a German party. In response, the club issued another report through the New Orleans Republican, refuting these claims. The English language papers positioned the German Political Reform Club as part of the New Orleans community. The reporting, however, shows the Germans as a distinct group within New Orleans. The call for political reform by the German community continued into the 1870s. As the Tagliche Deutsche Zeitung reported about politics at regional, national, and international levels, the editors also urged for political reform in local parties. Their call for reform, however, differed from the English language papers. Instead of reporting on the meetings, the paper, issued, the paper instead issued direct calls for reform. Citing a similar article from the Anziger des Westens, a democratic German language paper from St. Louis, the Tagliche Deutsche Zeitung pushed for voting as a bloc in ward elections and urged citizens to vote. The paper identifies corruption in the government at, at the state and parish level political party conventions. The writer argues that party affiliations muddle the decision in choosing candidate. Like in the English language newspapers, the call for reform did not promote one political party distinctly. The editor, however, notes his affiliation with the Democratic Party as an example for how to choose for how to vote. Although he considers himself a lifelong Democrat, or at least as long as he has been in the United States, the editor states that he also voted for candidates based on their qualities rather than political affiliation. Despite the editor and publishers publicly calling for political reform, the Tagliche Deutsche Zeitung remained neutral during the first years of the Reconstruction era. The paper merely reports state and local politics. If the editor provided an opinion, it supported, it supported whatever the national government was doing. When reporting on Ulysses S. Grant's presidential inauguration, for example, the Democratic editor sees Grant's presidency as bringing peace to the nation or an era of peace, harmony, and prosperity lies before the land with the inauguration of Grant. While the paper remained neutral in the early Reconstruction era, the paper's opinions about European affairs shined. The Tagliche Deutsche Zeitung criticized European affairs, specifically in the newly formed Germany and surrounding countries such as Austria. Forster's critique illuminates the connection to their homeland despite engagement with American political affairs. Allegiance to the German identity is further reflected in how the editor referred to the Czechs as dumb and Southern, and Southern Europeans as simple-minded. During the mid to late 19th century, Bohemian Czechs and Bohemian Germans argued over borders as Germany expanded and Czechs arrived to the larger industrial German-ran cities. Discrimination against other Europeans continued throughout the late 19th century. After Reconstruction officially ended in 1877, the Tagliche Deutsche Zeitung provided more opinions on American politics that matched their opinionated articles on German political affairs. The 1891 lynching of Italian immigrants in New Orleans serves as one example. In 1890, xenophobia towards Italian immigrants in New Orleans came to a head. 
even within the German community. The New Orleans police chief accused an Italian immigrant of shooting him in October 1890. The city observed, observed the case in court, many hoping to see the Italian found guilty. After the trial in March 1891 proved the Italian not guilty, a mob descended upon the Italian New Orleans community and lynched 15 Italian immigrants. The paper's opinions mirrors those of the larger Crescent City. The article describes the lynchings as hopefully deadly, and they considered the lynchings to be a service of the people of the city. The German language press offers one perspective on the German New Orleans community, community's engagement with American and European political affairs. The Tagliche Deutsche Zeitung illuminates the, Germans commun the German community's ability to adapt in a pluralist society while also preserving the German culture. Although the, although the reports during the Reconstruction era remain neutral in wake of the multiple political stances in, Recon in the Reconstruction era, New Orleans, once Reconstruction ended in 1877, the paper's democratic stances reappeared. Folster's pro-unionist sentiment in Confederate New Orleans fueled his self-censorship during the Reconstruction era. His ability to understand how his stances could be perceived in the pluralist society aided in the longevity of the Tagliche Deutsche Zeitung. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Hurst. That was very interesting. Um, our third uh, presenter um, is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Greg Robinson. Uh, Greg Robinson is professor of history at the University of Quebec at Montreal, and I'm not going to try to add the French inflection, a specialist in uh, U.S. political history. He has written several notable books, including By Order of the President from Harvard University Press, which uncovers Franklin Roosevelt's uh, central involvement in Japanese-American confinement. Um, a Tragedy of Democracy, Columbia University Press, winner of the 2009 AAAS History Book Prize, which uh, studies Japanese American and Japanese Canadian confinement in transnational context. His book, After Camp, um, uh, University of California Press in 2012, the winner was the winner of the Caroline Bancroft History Prize, and it centers on the post war uh, resettlement. His most recent book is The Unsung Great with the University of Washington Press, an alternative history of Japanese Americans. And Professor Robinson's paper and presentation is entitled Diplomacy, Power, and the Press, the Pro-Japan Campaign in 1930s Louisiana. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming and watching. I want to talk about, uh, as, as you say, the pro-Japan campaigns of uh, people in Louisiana during the 1930s. The history of New Orleans, like the rest of the American South, is fundamentally intertwined with the evolution of the cotton trade. Although scholars of the cotton South have tended to focus their attention on the 19th century, especially during the antebellum King Cotton era, the story, in fact, continues on into the 20th century, during which time New Orleans reigned as the country's largest cotton market. By 1915, for example, with 2,182 vessels, calling annually at a gross shipping tonnage of 6,423,648 tons, the largest part of which was cotton shipments, New Orleans could once more claim to be the second port of the nation after New York. And it was a position that she held through the 1920s into the 1930s. During the Depression years, when raw cotton was the nation's chief export commodity, sales of it were fundamental to New Orleans. By 1935, cotton sales themselves represented just about half of the total value of exports through the port of New Orleans. Now, what's interesting is that during this time in the early 20th century, trade shifted from Europe to a new center across the Pacific, Japan. Through the first half of the 20th century, raw cotton represented the bulk of US exports to Japan and helped fuel Japan's industrial revolution. By 1931, during the depression, Japan had actually surpassed Great Britain as, a, as the world's largest producer of cotton textiles. So where did Japan get its cotton? From the United States, shipped through the port of New Orleans. Trade expanded most heavily after 1918, when the opening of the Panama Canal and the end of World War I made direct shipments from Louisiana to Japan practical. Not only did New Orleans serve as a central market for the cotton trade, but the port was directly integrated into a global Japanese trade network that included exchanges with Africa and South America. Um, I don't have time to talk about it really today, but you can understand it was not profitable for ships to go empty from Japan to Louisiana. So in fact, Japanese shipping lines made up circular uh, around the globe 
shipping from Japan to South Africa and Southeast Asia, then on to Brazil, where they would buy uh, coffee and then sell the coffee in New Orleans and buy cotton and ship it back to Japan through the Panama Canal. So the lucrative trade was imperiled, however, during the 1930s by the great power rivalries in the Pacific and the tension caused by Japan's rise as an imperial power in East Asia. Although the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in 1931, followed by the establishment of the puppet state of Manchukuo by the Japanese, did not itself affect the cotton trade very much, Japan's military invasion and occupation of China in 1937 did. It sparked the formation of progressive groups, such as the American Friends of the Chinese People, who called for boycotts of Japan and organized protest rallies in port cities such as San Francisco. There was an umbrella group called the American Committee for Non-Participation in Japanese Aggression, which organized chapters nationwide. And in the South, they relied on Christian groups and Chinese Americans and progressives of different kinds. Ironically, at first, the cotton trade increased as a result of the, of the Sino-Japanese War, because in order to provide aid to China and particularly buy Chinese silver, U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt with the concordance of congressional leaders, refused to invoke the 1935 or 1937 Neutrality Acts, which banned all sales of arms and strategic materials to belligerents. That is, the, he continued to trade with both China and Japan. But since America had far larger trade with Japan, it remained unrestricted in the Japanese war machine, which required huge amounts of cotton, not only for uniforms, but for explosives, and parachutes could obtain it from American sellers. However, beginning in 1938, the level of trade started to decline sharply. Cotton producers reacted to the international situation, thus by organizing efforts using their Southern identity to try and maintain good relations between Japan and the United States with the goal of encouraging Japanese to buy more American cotton. So as early as September 1937, right around the time that the Japanese invaded mm -hmm. China, Francis G. Hickman, the editor of the newspaper Cotton's Trade Journal, began working together with Yuki Sato, the Japanese consul in New Orleans, to put together a favorable publicity campaign for Japan. Hickman then recruited James E. Edmonds, a journalist, to tour Japan and write favorable articles about the Japanese for the Cotton Trade Journal. Sato, for his part, provided letters of introduction for Edmonds to Japanese textile industrialists and commercial attaches. Hickman admitted frankly to Edmonds that, quote, the public opinion is strong for China in this country, and while we are opposing this feeling with your articles, certainly the interest of the South is for continued friendship with Japan if we want to sell them cotton, close quote. I should say, in addition to his series in the Cotton Trade Journal, Edmonds placed one article in the Curtis Publishing Company's magazine, Country Gentleman, although he failed to interest the Saturday Evening Post in any of his writing. In 1940, Hickman would himself visit Japan and spend several weeks in Kobe to try and urge the Japanese to buy more American cotton. Meanwhile, other groups stepped in. Uh, a shadowy group that called itself the Southern Association of Japanese Students put out a propaganda pamphlet in 1938 entitled Salient Facts About Far East Japan's Biggest Single Market for United States Cotton. It presented the case that since Japan was the largest market for American cotton, Southerners should naturally support Japan against China. A similar pamphlet, but one undated, called New State of Manchukuo, was put out around the same time by a group that called itself the Japanese Student Association of the South. Now, these two pamphlets were both published in New Orleans, and they both followed the official Japanese line on Far East questions. They both groups listed themselves as based in New Orleans, but neither uh, of the pamphlets provided any information on membership or on uh, their activities, and they didn't seem to have any activities other than these pamphlets. So with all of these in place, these facts in mind, I have to conclude that the Japanese consulate was either supporting or indeed creating uh, these pamphlets and behind the groups. Japanese authorities also used soft power diplomacy in search of allies. At the end of 1939, when the Roosevelt administration announced that the U.S. would be withdrawing from the Japanese-American Commercial Treaty, which gave most favored nation status to Japan, which would make uh, trade much more expensive because of tariffs. Uh, Kenzo Ito, the new New Orleans consul of Japan, organized 
a new group, the Lafcadio O'Hearn Society of New Orleans, in tribute to the famed writer and Japan uh, commentator. As honorary president of the society, uh, Consul Ito joined forces with Taman Maeda, the director of a Tokyo-financed propaganda group called the Japan Institute in New York, which was described in contemporary reports as the cultural headquarters of Japan in the Western Hemisphere, to put together a Lafcari O'Hearn Memorial. Their initial plan was to create a Lafcari O'Hearn Memorial Room at the Cabildo under the auspices of the Louisiana Historical Society. In the end, however, they opted for a more scholarly venue, and with financial aid from the Japanese government, they arranged for the construction of a new Lafcari O'Hearn Memorial Room at Tulane University's then newly built Howard Tilton Memorial Library. So the new room featured editions of all of Hearn's work and correspondence uh, from and to him in both English and Japanese, plus pamphlets and letters written by Hearn to friends and students. Japanese donors shipped 70 volumes of Hearn's published works from Japan for its collections. The room was dedicated in March 1941, when there was a ceremony attended by some 200 people. The Lafcadio Hearn Society of New Orleans then published a special commemorative volume of the inauguration ceremony with the texts of speeches presented at the event, and all sorts of photos of uh, political leaders. Well, despite its visibility, the positive campaign was largely ineffective. Uh, the Roosevelt administration went to, proceeded with its uh, announced termination of the 1911 Japan, Japanese American Treaty of Commerce in January 1940. This triggered official limitations on trade and banking credits for Japan. In response, Ben J. Williams of New Orleans, the vice president of the American Cotton Shippers Association, stated that whatever the nature of the conflicts between the United States and Japan, the Cotton South absolutely needed Japanese markets for their product, and thus urged his readers to contact their representatives in the capital to urge them to work for renewal of the trade treaty. In the middle of 1940, Williams complained that the end of the treaty had cost cotton growers 1,700,000 bales per year in Japanese purchases. And in May, at a convention in New Orleans, the American Cotton Shippers Association voted a resolution ur urging the federal government to take the initiative to preserve the South trade with Japan. And resolved the association communicate to the President of the United States, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Agriculture, and the Secretary of Commerce its belief that the retention and development of American cotton exports to Japan is a vital necessity and is respectfully urged that an effort be made to place our commercial relations with Japan on a sound and permanent basis in the interest of the cotton South and the entire nation. Well, by summer 1941, as Japanese purchases dropped, cotton declined by almost $4 per bale in the open market. Uh, Nevertheless, it was clear that the cutoff with Japan had strongly affected the price. And in summer 1941, on the pretext of repairs to the Panama Canal, the United States government denied Japanese ships access to the canal, even though American ships continued to pass through it. As a result, the last Japanese commercial vessels in the Atlantic in mid-1941 were first to sail around Cape Horn in order to return home. Well, the pro-Japanese campaign to conclude demonstrated the vulnerability of US-Japan trade in the face of international politics. The attempts of the propagandists to invoke the specificity of Southern identity and Southern needs in support of the trade marks a curious episode in the history of regionalism in the United States. Uh, if I can take just one more minute, I would say that while the trade uh, was cut off during the war, and in fact, there were Japanese nationals interned in Louisiana in large numbers. Interestingly enough, the trade revived almost as soon as the war was over. By 1952, before even the signing of the US-Japanese uh, 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 peace treaty, there was a new consul in New Orleans. And by 1960, uh, it is estimated that Japan had become New Orleans and Louisiana's largest foreign trading partner. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Robinson. Um, okay, I'm going to, um, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to keep my um, comments brief uh, so that we can allow more time for um, any questions from the um, audience participants and then to allow the presenters to maybe elaborate a little bit more on their work because there's so much more they could say. Um, I have to admit, um, at, at, uh, at first, I was not quite sure how this session was going to work and how the papers would be uh, would be held together. Uh, and yet, you know, after reading the papers and hearing the presentations, they they do, in fact, um, you know, despite very, very different topics, 
I, I think they really do raise a number of um, uh, important issues and interesting uh, questions that we can explore, uh, such that I, I hardly know where to begin because I could devote all of my time and comments to any one of the uh, of the three papers. Uh, but let me just give it give it a shot here and try to make some broad um, broad observations and then say a couple of things about each of each of the uh, each of the papers. Uh, I'm certainly I, I would consider myself at least um, familiar with uh, Miss Roos's topic, even if I'm not you know terribly knowledgeable about about the topic. Um, as for the papers by and the and the topics by uh, uh, Professor Owens and Robinson, I have to complete uh, admit. I won't even say virtual, I will say complete ignorance, <laughs> and yet I found them both, both really fascinating. Um, I don't know if there are any participants here, maybe there may, I guess there's probably a couple, uh, Charles and James, who will remember um, uh, uh, Larry Powell's uh, presidential address, I think from 2012, in which he said, and anybody who's taught Louisiana history would, would you know, appreciate this, is that you can basically teach U.S. history by teaching Louisiana history. Uh, we often focus on the uniqueness and the weirdness of Louisiana, and yet it really is a lens through which you can look at, at American history itself. And all three of these papers, I think, really do do demonstrate that. And even uh, with, you know, particularly with uh, Professor Robinson's paper, extend that into the 20th century, and particularly with uh, with uh, foreign policy and the lead up to the U.S. participation uh, in the Second World War. I think all three papers to varying degrees show the importance, also the limitations, and that, but that's not a criticism, just the reality, but the importance and the limitations of viewing, looking at the press or the media or other forms of, of disseminating information as a way of understanding popular attitudes um, or the ideas of an entire group um, or, uh, or population. Let me just say a couple of things about uh, Professor uh, Owens's uh, paper, a uh, very interesting, uh, you know, issue about the U.S. intervening possibly in the Yucatan multidimensional conflict. Um, the opinions uh, that were expressed in Louisiana newspapers that he kind of skipped over in his formal presentation, I thought were really interesting. It showed a really um, wide cross section of attitudes. And then these were also replicated in the Senate debate. So we get a sense of it. And what I found most interesting about this is that, uh, that many of the opinions that are expressed are exactly the kinds of things that we would expect or anticipate. But then there were also things that it's like, he said that. And it was, you know, really quite, I think, quite an interesting twist that I would not have um, uh, anticipated. Um, and so this very obscure relatively brief, brief episode, I think, um, you know, sheds light on just, you know, um, uh, issues of race, slavery, expansionism, manifest destiny, partisan politics in the second party system uh, in an election year. Uh, and so I'd, I'd actually just kind of be interested to hear more about if, if this is part of a, you know, a larger project, because it really is uh, quite a, an interesting, um, uh, if little known story. Uh, with uh, Ms. Roos's uh, paper, uh, we see, in a way, the, the kind of the, the classic um, dichotomy between, uh, you know, cultural preservation versus assimilation um, with, you know, with an, with an ethnic group. Um, and, you know, as though, as though reconstruction politics in Louisiana is not already complicated enough, then we can look at you know the German dimension and see how the how you know the German uh, population in New Orleans while it's while it's negotiating those issues of assimilation and cultural preservation and identity are are now involved in you know in reconstruction politics where there is no neutrality uh, and where you know um, uh, as Michael Perman you know classified this characterized this as a a, a crisis of legitimacy. Uh, when the government's the very uh, existence is is considered illegitimate, and so how did the German population try to you know navigate that minefield? Um, one thing I I, I would uh, note uh, for Ms. Roos, she may uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Roos, she may be aware of this person's work, um, uh, Angela Zimmerman, who's at the uh, at Was George Washington University, uh, used to be Andrew Zimmerman, um, uh, but uh, is now uh, uh, identified as as Angela Zimmerman. Uh, uh, but uh, she's written, you know, really interesting work on German imperialism in the 19th century and its connections to the United States um, and the Civil War. Not Louisiana per se, but uh, but she's doing really interesting work making these connections. And I think um, it would be, uh, you know, worth your while. If, you probably are familiar with her work, uh, but if not, look at her work to kind of maybe frame 
your larger, you know, your larger project. And then, of course, there's the obvious connections between the German experience in New Orleans versus the Irish, the Italians, and how that, you know, works itself. But this is really, really, you know, uh, really good stuff. And I'd, I'd really be interested in more knowing here what they say about, you know, you noted very briefly in the paper, but that, that's not what your paper was about, but the issues of German unification, the place of Germany in, in you know, in, uh, in Europe, the Franco-Prussian War with the whole French, you know, dimension of, of Louisiana. Um, and this probably lies outside of your, you know, your, your work. But then what happens in the First World War, you know, with the anti-German hysteria? Um, it just, you know, blows everything up, I would imagine. But that may be outside of, you know, the scope of what you're, you're doing in this project. Um, and then finally, um, I'll make this very brief with, with Professor Robinson's. I just thought this was fascinating. I, I know nothing about it, and yet it, it, it just really grabbed me. Uh, and to think that, you know, the, the, that the United States um, cotton and Southern cotton is fueling, as you say, Japan's industrial revolution at, as it had fueled the industrial revolution of the 19th century um, in the North um, and Europe. Uh, and, and uh, you know, this reminds me of, you know, the work of Walter Lefebvre and others in looking at American foreign policy being driven by material interests versus morality um, and ideals, um, et cetera. Uh, and, and I just, you know, I, I found what you were what you were getting at really interesting and, would, and certainly would be interested in hearing, you know, more about it and the, the larger project of which of which this is a part. So I'm going to stop with my comments there and, and open up the floor to questions. We do have some uh, comments in the chat. I'm not sure, James or Charles, what we're supposed to do here now on the online. Um... John, why don't you read the questions uh, to the presenters, the, the, if the ones that are presented there? Okay. Um, there's one. Oh, this is from Greg. Oh, Greg, you post... I, yeah, I posted a okay. question for uh, the same question that you had about uh, the attitude of the Louisiana German press in regard to the franco prussian oh. War. So this is actually something that I'm hoping to investigate this summer when I head down to um, New Orleans. This paper was actually written in one of my research classes this um, in the during the fall semester. So unfortunately, I was limited to di the digitized versions of the Taglische Deutsche Zeitung. And um, so while the, the Franco-Prussian War was reported on in the paper, the paper unfortunately was uploaded mirrored, so I wasn't able to read it. However, it exists in a library in New Orleans, and so I'm hoping to be able to expand that portion of the paper um, after I do some research this summer. I, do, I don't, it doesn't look like we have any other questions per se in the chat. Um, did either, did either uh, uh, Greg or Jeffrey uh, want to say anything about the larger, the, you know, the larger context of these papers? Well, <clears throat> this was, uh, I gave an earlier version of this at the Gulf South conference and wasn't happy with how it went. I was determined to do a better job the second time. And um, everyone there said, I've never heard of this. I mean, it seems like just nobody knows. And the only reason that I ever knew about this topic was I went to Merida, Mexico last summer. And while I was there, I found out that they had tried to be a state in the United States, which was very curious to me. It's something that I had never known about. But um uh, getting into the the research itself what was so fascinating to me were all of the speeches of the various senators the debate was was very deep and profound in a lot of ways and um if i ever do anything with it i think it will be a screenplay no. uh because it's one of those sort of like the 12 angry men all the all the people just talking and and interacting with each other in each their personality just becomes so strikingly shown by the way that they talk. Henry Foote of Mississippi comes out as just a sleaze bag, and uh, John J. Crittenden of Kentucky gave the most noble and elegant speech that I have ever heard. It, I would have loved to have seen 
him given the chance to prevent the Civil War with the Crittenden compromises. And then, of course, the Louisiana senators just, it was hilarious. They said, if, if Senator Johnson of Louisiana does not keep motioning to table this bill, I am going to call the question. <laughs> <laughs> So in my case, it actually uh, forms a part of, in a sense, two different uh, parts of a project. Uh, that is, there's a larger book about the history of the transnational connections between Japan and Louisiana. Uh, but that's more in the style of episodes from this history, which includes um, the presence of Japan in the Cotton, State, Cotton Centennial Exhibition in 1884-1885, which is where uh, the young chemist Yokichi Takamine is the co-director of the Japanese pavilion. And uh, that's when he becomes introduced to New Orleans. Uh, he marries his landlord's daughter and later brings cotton, Japanese cotton buyers to uh, Louisiana. And then of course invents uh, adrenaline and becomes a multimillionaire. Then there's the, the story of the Japanese athletes in Louisiana during the first part of the 20th century, the Japanese doctors who uh, study the the Japanese rice importation that reshapes Louisiana rice industry. There's a whole extraordinary story about the connections that start with commercial connections and then become cultural connections uh, between Japan and Louisiana. For example, the Japanese opera uh, by Puccini, Madame Butterfly, becomes a standard uh, of uh, Louisiana opera and Japanese sopranos and Japanese American sopranos are welcomed, but during World War II, it becomes a taboo. And there is actually a kind of a referendum in the pages of the New Orleans item and the New Orleans Times Picayune about whether to permit the, the showing of Madame Butterfly, and the answer is no. Uh, but there's, it's, so within all of this enormous story, uh, is the strictly or properly economic question. The, the number of boats that went from New Orleans to Japan, the, uh, the, the particular political actions that took place because of the cotton trade, the establishment of the uh, New Orleans consulate, and then the New Orleans Japan Society based on the cotton trade. But so I created a, an article for the uh, journal Louisiana history. Well, first I, I published an article in French and then I expanded it into English, uh, for the English version. And what you heard tonight is part of the, the, new, the, the new material that I found. And uh, so because it's much more, again, standard economic history, although economic history by somebody like me, who's very much a beginner uh, and has all sorts of non-economic elements. I thought that it would not work well with the rest of the book. And so I decided to put it in a, in a different place. And yet, of course, there are there is overlap and it's all part of a, a larger story, which I hope that somebody else can take over from me. I see that Jeffrey has asked if I found anything about Japanese horticulturalists. Well, there is an Ikebana society run by uh, the wife of Dr. Aramora, um, and it becomes quite famous. Also, there are um, uh, Japanese flower growers in uh, Louisiana and in, and in Mobile, Alabama, who provide flowers, chrysanthemums, for the New Orleans market. I, uh, of course, the, the history of Japanese horticulture and Louisiana is, is uh, a somewhat troubled one because part of the uh, establishment of the Japanese pavilion at the Cotton Centennial Exhibition was the bringing of Japanese plants to Louisiana as lanyap, and among them were the kudzu vine and the water hyacinth. Oh, no. <laughs> the Japanese eat kuzu. They eat it as a starch. So they control it very well, and it's a very uh, enriching plant. But in Louisiana, they never got around to eating it, and it, and it ran wild. There, right, there, there were the 
Jap the camellias by the Japanese uh, growers in Mobile and the Japanese pears, yes. And there's even an attempt to bring in Japanese frogs or to, that is to produce frogs for the Japanese market. Uh, Greg, what what happens in terms of the uh, cultural exchanges um, in the aftermath of the Second World War? Uh, it was, you know, in a way, kind of suppressed, if you will, during the war. What happened? Does it revive uh, quickly or not so much like the economics? It, it, it revives in a different form. On the one hand, for example, Antoine's famous Japanese room, which uh, opened a great fanfare in 1910 and is closed during the Second World War does not reopen until, in fact, until, not until the 1980s. And uh, Madame Butterfly uh, is is forbidden until uh, the late 1940s, when the soprano Tomi Kanazawa is invited to come and sing it. Uh, she just died at the age of 105, and as her as her leading man, the the young tenor Mario Lanza. Uh, performs uh, Pinkerton. In fact, it's his only his only leading stage role before he goes into the movies. There is a good deal of uh, contact during the 1950s with the revived Japan Society. For example, the Japanese Japan Society funds the uh, building of a Japanese little Japanese sand garden at the New Orleans Public Library building, and uh, there's other cultural contacts. Um, the the Eddie Robinson and the Grambling State football team is invited to Japan to play bowl games. The first bowl games played outside the United States, and then the Emperor of Japan invites the Grambling State band to come play for him. And there are all sorts of uh, Japanese jazz men who come to Preservation Hall. Like there's this group from Osaka called the New Orleans uh, Rascals. And and there are other and and there's uh, the Japanese Sachmo, who is a, a jazz man and a photographer who comes to Louisiana and uh, becomes famous after Katrina when he um, contributes music raises funds to contribute Japanese from Japan musical instruments for the poor children of Louisiana. So I see there's a question for yes. Sophia, can you see the question from from uh, from Jeffrey? Yes. Okay. So um, there were actually both Catholic and Lutheran congregations in New Orleans, or German German speaking Catholic and Lutheran congregations in New Orleans. I actually just finished a paper that I'm presenting at the Society of German American Studies um, in late April about um, Lutheran uh, German speaking Lutherans in New Orleans and. Um, their assimilation process from a German speaking congregation to an English speaking congregation right before um, the outbreak of the first um, world war actually. German Jews, um, I haven't looked at them as much. So I've really only looked at German Lutherans so far. Hopefully as I expand this into my MA thesis and I expand this work into an eventual dissertation I will look at um, the other religious groups as well more. New Orleans, of course, becomes a, a, an important center for German Jews, uh, as in the family of Lillian Hellman. Uh, anything? Anything else from uh, any uh, other? Um participants or um, audience members, I suppose. No. Uh, are, are we going to go ahead and um, adjourn then, James? Yep, that, that sounds good. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Okay. <laughs>